Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to my channel, and this is going to be the long-awaited video that is going to tie all of my metaphysics series together and show, in my opinion, the most important conclusion to all of the reasoning and examination of nature that we have done so far. In this video, I'm going to be showing small segments of other videos that I've made, so just be prepared. Well, let's get started. So unlike many of the caricatures of Aquinas' first way, his is actually very sophisticated and reasons with certitude. He starts off by acknowledging that change occurs, big shocker, and then takes on the classic Aristotelian doctrine of act and potency. Now I did an entire video on what that is and how it is important, so I won't be going very much into that today, but I am going to play some clips from my previous videos titled metaphysics act and potency distinction so that you guys can better understand the argument. So here it is. Aristotle says that change is comprised of things going from potentially being a certain way to actually being a certain way. For example, an unlit match is potentially lit but not actually lit. But if something were to actualize that potential of it being able to be lit, then the match would be lit. The potential of that match to be lit exists in a certain sense. Even if the match isn't actually lit, the potential for it to be lit does exist, and this together with some external influence that actualizes this potential, suffices to show how the change can occur. So no potential can actualize itself, and in this sense, anything that changes requires something outside of it to change it. This is true even of animals which seem at first glance to change themselves. For what this always amounts to is really just one part of the animal being changed by another. The dog, quote unquote, moves itself across the room, but only insofar as the potential motion of the legs of the dog is actualized by the flexing of the leg muscles, and their potential to be flexed is actualized by the firing of the motor neurons. And the potential of the motor neurons to fire is actualized by the other neurons, and so on and so forth. Thus, we have the classical Aristotelian principle, Whatever is changed is changed by another, or in its more traditional formulation, whatever is moved is moved by another. Now it must be noted here that when Aristotelians speak of motion, they are not merely speaking of local motion, but change more generally. So whenever they say whatever is moved is moved by another, they are really just saying something like whatever is changed is changed by another. This is the more archaic meaning of the word, but it's important for us to understand how they're using it. Another technicality is that while actuality and potentiality are fully intelligible only in relation to each other, there is an asymmetry between them with actuality having metaphysical priority. A potential is always a potential for a certain kind of actuality. For instance, potential gooeyness is just the potential to be actually gooey. Furthermore, potentiality cannot exist on its own, but only in combination with actuality. Hence, there is no such thing as potential gooeyness all by itself. This would kind of be what um, classical theists refer to as prime matter, but that's kind of besides the point. But only in something like an actual rubber ball can potential gooeyness be found. It is incoherent to speak of something existing and being purely potential with no actuality whatsoever, but it is not incoherent to speak of something as purely actual with no potentiality. Indeed, for Aristotle, there is such a being, namely God. Now that we've looked at what act and potency is, we will move on to an essentially order causal series, which is probably the most vital piece of this entire argument. So here it is. Now, an essentially ordered causal series is very different in that each member in the series does receive its causal power essentially from the member previous in the series. A great example of this is a series of rings that are holding each other up. If you were to take away, say, the top one, they would all fall down in the series because they are essentially deriving their causal power from the member previous in the series. This type of series has to be tracked back to a first cause. Otherwise, none of the members would receive any causal power. Moreover, this happens in one moment of time, not stretched back temporally throughout time. Now, Aquinas has a specific example he gives that shows why this essentially ordered causal series cannot go back forever. Here it is. A great example to demonstrate this is Aquinas, when he says that there is a hand that moves a stick that moves a rock on the ground. 
In one moment of time, the hand actualizes the potential of the stick to move, which then actualizes the potential of the rock to move. Notice that at any moment in time, if you were to take away the stick, then the rock would cease movement as it essentially derives its causal power from the stick, and the stick essentially derives its causal power from the hand, and so on and so forth. Back to the first cause. Again, this happens in one moment of time. Notice that I use the word moment because it's not like this is happening every second. It's literally happening every single instance of time or moment of time. It's a technical philosophical term. Taking all this into consideration, we arise at a problem. In the example of the hand, the stick, and the rock, we saw how each thing that was higher up in the series actualized the potential of the member below it. But the problem comes in when we realize that the hand had to have its potential to move actualized by another. But if this is the case, which it is, we have to keep following this chain up until we find the first member in the series. Mathema demonstrates this in his video titled, A Defense of Classical Theology Part 1, The New Atheism and the Cosmological Arguments. So here it is. Of course, the example I gave isn't really the full story. The forearm only contains its motive power because the biceps muscle contracts. So, we might say that the stone is being moved by the contraction of the bicep muscle, ultimately. The story doesn't end there, either. We can descend to deeper and deeper levels of reality in the here and now. The contraction of the biceps muscle, which is an actualization of a potential, only occurs because of the firing of motor neurons innervating the muscle. In this series of movers, if the neuron stops firing, the stick loses its motive power. And even the actualization of the potential for these motor neurons firing only occurs because of the shape or conformation of specialized ion channel proteins within the nerve. We can go further and further and descend into finer levels of reality, but the point is that each member in this series derives its ability to actualize a potential from a more fundamental member in the series. The conclusion of this is demonstrated by Edward Fazer here. So the idea is that when we trace causes downward here and now, or again upward if you want to use that metaphor instead, we trace them downward here and now, what we get is um, one thing being actualized by another being actualized by another. And the only place the buck can stop, the only place we can read it, reach an ultimate explanation, is if we get to something that can um, actualize all these other things without itself being actualized. It's what I call in the book an, an unactualized actualizer, or a purely actual actualizer. It can actualize everything else without itself being actualized, because it's already always, as it were, purely actual. It's got no potentials that need to be or could be actualized. So it's a kind of uncaused cause in a traditional mm. sense, meaning not one that simply happens to lack a cause, but something that could not have had a cause in principle because it's already pure actuality and in no way potential. Fazer makes it clear here that we must reach something that is pure act, or in Latin, actus purus. The reason this is the case is because for anything that has potentiality, we could always ask, what actualized that potential? And this cannot go on forever because we are dealing with an essentially order causal series that must have a first mover, which must be pure act. And this argument is deductive in nature, which means that it, if its premises are true and the logic is valid, then we must accept the conclusion. There is no space for an opinion here, only objective fact. And the reason we must arrive at something that is pure act is be not because we're committing a special pleading fallacy or anything like that. No, it's because it cannot be any possible other way than they're arriving at a pure act. There's no other way. The logic shows that you have to arrive at this pure act. And this argument is reasoning from effects to cause going up the chain so the information we get about God is actually negative knowledge of him. And the reason this is important is because if you look at another example and say that there are four colors that exist and there is an object that is not any of these three certain colors, then it necessarily has to be the fourth color. That's the only option available. And the same thing here, you have to arrive at a pure act because it is the only option available. It does not commit a special pleading fallacy. And Mathema has this great little section in one of his videos where he talks about an example involving power strips and just to show how ridiculous it is that people say that like, oh, it's a special pleading fallacy when you arrive at a pure act. It's not really the only case, so here it is. Imagine this situation. Imagine you try to power your laptop by plugging it into a power strip. And then you try to power the power strip by plugging that into another power strip. And then you plug in the power strip to yet another power strip. Is your laptop going to be powered? Suppose someone suggested, yeah, but how about I do this infinitely many times? I plug in a power strip into another one, into another one infinitely many times. 
Then I can power my laptop. Now, if you think that such a suggestion would be a little bit ridiculous, then think about what you're saying when you propose an infinite regress. For if there is no power, if you will, then there can be no power to actualize. And if nothing can actualize, nothing can be actualized. And if nothing can be actualized, then nothing can change. And that is utterly contrary to experience. Now, many people will at this point admit that this pure act does exist, but claim that it shares little with what people call God. And if someone is trying to use this argument to show that Jesus is God, then the person saying that it doesn't prove Christianity would be correct. But this isn't even the point of the argument in the first place. And pure act does have many characteristics that are in line with what people typically call God. For this, I'm going to be quoting a section in Edward Fazer's book, Aquinas, A Beginner's Guide, from the subsection on divine attributes. Now, before we begin, I must say that this is a rough sketch, so please don't take these arguments to be the full story. Instead, I will have citations to the Summa Theologiae so that you can go and read more on what exactly Aquinas has to say on this subject matters. And he goes through and has the objections labeled. He steel mans them instead of straw manning them, and then he goes back and responds to each and every one. So if you really want to get technical and you think you have an objection, go read what he has to say. One little quick disclaimer first before I quote Phaser is that he does present the five ways before he goes into talking about all these divine attributes. So he is referencing topics that are discussed in the other four ways that Aquinas presents. So if they show up here in the quotes, which they do, don't think I'm just presenting them and expecting you to believe in them. They're just part of the quote and just focus on the parts that relate to the first way in pure act. Aquinas says, There is and can only be one God. For there to be more than one God, there would have to be some essence that the distinct gods all share, each with his own act of existence. But since God is that being in whom essence and existence are identical, who just is existence or being itself, there is no sense to be made in the idea that he shares an essence with anything else, or has one act of existing alongside others. Aquinas also gives two other reasons for holding that the being whose existence is argued for in the five ways is necessarily unique. For there to be more than one such beam, there would have to be some way to distinguish one from another, and this could only be in terms of some perfection or privation that one has but the other lacks. But as pure act, such a being would be devoid of all imperfections and privations, since imperfections and privations are just different ways in which something can fail to be in act or actual. Hence there can be no way even in principle to distinguish one being from another, and there could not possibly be more than one. Furthermore, the air order that characterizes the world gives it a unity that is explicable only if there is also unity in its cause. For Aquinas, God is simple in the sense of being in no way composed of parts. Why is this the case? Well, he has no potentiality whatsoever. Several attributes seem to follow immediately and obviously from God being pure act. Since to change is to be reduced from potency to act, that which is pure act, devoid of all potency, must be immutable or incapable of change. Since material things are of their nature compounds of act and potency, that which is pure act must be immaterial and thus incorporeal or without any sort of body. Since such a being is immutable and time, as Aquinas argues, cannot exist apart from change, that which is pure act must also be eternal outside time altogether, without beginning or end. As the cause of the world, God obviously has power, for all operations proceed from power. Moreover, the more actual a thing is, the more it abounds in active power, so that as pure act, God must be infinite in power. In line with the mainstream classical theistic tradition, Aquinas holds that since there is no sense to be made of doing what is intrinsically impossible, that is making a round square or something else involving a self-contradiction like a married bachelor, to say that God is omnipotent does not entail that he can do such things, but only that he can do whatever is intrinsically possible. Since something is perfect to the degree it is in act or actual, God as pure act must be perfect, giving the convertibility of being in goodness, and that's talking about transcendentals, which I haven't covered, FYI. God as pure act and being itself must be good indeed the highest good, and at this point it might be objected that the problem of evil cast doubt on this claim. For if God is good, why hasn't he eliminated the evil that obviously exists in the world? But there are several problems with this objection. First of all, it can only undermine Aquinas' argument for God's goodness if we assume that a good being could not possibly have a reason to allow evil. 
but it is notoriously difficult to show that such a being could not possibly have a reason, and even more contemporary atheist philosophers would not make such a strong claim. In the absence of such an assumption, though Aquinas could simply insist that his arguments have proven that God exists and is good, it follows that whatever evil exists must be consistent with his goodness. Therefore, it is clear that this pure act is indeed what people typically think of when they say God, and has many of the attributes that are ascribed to him, such as him being omnipotent, omniscient, immutable, absolutely simple, composed of no parts, all good outside of time, there being only one God, and him being perfect. Now notice that throughout this entire video, I did not appeal to any divine revelation, aka Bible, Quran, stuff like that, but instead used only reason. Therefore, to simply say that belief in God, that is, the God of classical theism, is false and that people believe in fairy tales is completely untrue and is itself actually false and it's definitely a caricature. In conclusion, God exists and Aquinas' first way not only proves the existence of God, but can be used to show that many of the attributes traditionally ascribed to God are correct. Before I end this, I know that there will be people who try and say that Aquinas' first way is actually different, and that since I'm not quoting his summa on that section, I am actually making stuff up. But what I've presented is the interpretation of Aquinas' argument that has traditionally been used. Therefore, don't claim I am presenting something that is not actually what Aquinas believed. If you want to read presentations of Aquinas' first way that are not what he believed, then go read the new atheist on the subject because they grossly caricature the argument. They say things like, if everything has a cause, then what caused God? But notice that the question is misunderstanding what is said by Aquinas because he never says any he never says everything has a cause, only that what has been moved must be moved by another. But to avoid all of these people who would say that I never quoted Aquinas, I'm going to quote the entire paragraph where he presents the first way and highlight the parts that I talked about and show that what I presented today is an accurate interpretation of Aquinas. Aquinas in the Summa Theologiae, in the first part, in the second question, in Article 3, in the I answer that part, says, The first and more manifest way is the argument from motion. It is certain and evident to our senses that in the world some things are in motion. FYI, motion here means just change more generally. Now, whatever is in motion is put in motion by another. For nothing can be in motion except it is in potentiality to that towards which it is in motion, whereas a thing moves in as much as it is in act, for motion is nothing else than the reduction of something from potentiality to actuality. But nothing can be reduced from potentiality to actuality except by something in a state of actuality. Thus, that which is actually hot, as fire, makes wood, which is potentially hot, to be actually hot, and thereby moves and changes it. Now, it is not possible that the same thing should be at once in actuality and potentiality in the same respect, but only in different respects. For what is actually hot cannot simultaneously be potentially hot. But if it is simultaneously potentially cold, it is therefore impossible that in the same respect and in the same way a thing should be both mover and moved, that is, that it should move itself. Therefore, whatever is in motion must be put in motion by another. In this entire paragraph, he is, of course, talking about act and potency, which is what I outlined earlier in the video. Aquinas goes on to say, If that by which it is put in motion be itself put in motion, then this also must need be put in motion by another, and that by another again. But this cannot go on to infinity, because then there would be no first mover, and consequently no other mover. Seeing that subsequent movers move only in as much as they are put in motion by the first mover, as the staff moves only because it is put in motion by the hand. In this paragraph, he is talking about essentially ordered causal series, which is made clear with statements such as, seeing that subsequent movers move only in as much as they are put in motion by the first mover, and he even uses the analogy I talked about earlier when he says, as the staff moves only because it is put in motion by the hand. Therefore, Aquinas is indeed talking about an essentially ordered causal series, which is why the series cannot go on to infinity. Aquinas concludes by saying, Therefore it is necessary to arrive at a first mover, put in motion by no other, and this everyone understands to be God. This first mover is, of course, what I earlier called pure act, and Aquinas correctly identifies this being with God. Why does he identify this being with God? Because this pure act possesses all of the divine attributes that I talked about earlier, which is what people traditionally ascribe to God.
Finally, let's take a look at a couple of comments on my old video titled Response Thomas Aquinas Unmoved Mover Debunked, which I'm going to respond to. The first is a conversation I had with a person named Skeptic Pork. Man, you gotta love YouTube names, huh? In which he continually thought that this argument was contingent on the A theory of time and would fall apart if the B theory of time was correct. However, after some time, he eventually agreed with me, which can be seen here. Also, in the comments of this video, many people kept bringing up how they didn't see how this applied to the here and now and not just the distant past. But this is explained away when you correctly understand what an essentially order causal series is, although there are a fair number of people who don't understand what an essentially order causal series is. For instance, one person said these types of causal series are made up and don't really exist but are merely a mental projection upon the world. I disagree with this because in the example I gave of the stick, it clearly shows that if you take away the stick, then the rock will cease to move. Essentially, other causal series do exist, and we need to admit that. And there are, of course, a number of other arguments that I just i am not going to lay out here. Now, another misunderstanding is that people don't understand why these series can't go back forever. And they falsely say that this argument is committing a special pleading fallacy but I dedicated an entire video to the topic which shows why this series cannot go on to infinity and it also shows why an accidentally ordered causal series can go on to infinity. The distinction is very important, so please go check it out now. Another person claimed I didn't really present the real argument but only alluded to it. That's why in this video I read what Aquinas said to say and then showed you guys that it is exactly what I presented. I know the quote was really long but Sometimes you just got to do it because there are people out there who don't believe you. This person also said that these divine attributes are neither by defin or either by definition or without justification. But I showed that this is not the case and why they can all be attributed to God. I even made sure to cite exactly where they appeared in the Summa so that you can go read more about them if you have questions or don't understand it. And I don't even know how to respond to him saying, or in the case of omnipotence, illogical. Other than saying he's wrong because he gives no justification for him thinking this, it's ironic that he claims I give no justification to back my claims when he literally does the same thing in the next sentence. Illogical indeed. And Slippery Storm said, Dishonest video. Which I'm confused on how I'm supposed to take that since he could be saying that the video I was responding to was dishonest or that my video was dishonest. This is a prime example of why clear terms and unambiguous premises are so essential. Now, this man named the Romanist, and Romanism, by the way, is a derogatory term for Catholics. Um, it's just not really used anymore, but I don't know if that's why he's called the Romanist or what the deal is. But anyway, his name is the Romanist. He asks, what do you say to the argument, we do not know what happened before the Big Bang? I would respond by saying that it is irrelevant because the essentially ordered causal series shows that something has to be actualizing things every moment of time. Thus, I really don't care what happened 13.7 billion years ago or even 10 days ago because it is irrelevant to my argument. And Aquinas didn't even think you could prove the universe was finite in age. Therefore, it clearly has no power over his argument. Finally, Kevin Lopez said, Mr. Mattingly, assuming your logic is certain and beyond reproach, haven't you also effectively eliminated the need for faith? To this, I say a couple of things. First off, the First Vatican Council said, God, the origin and end of all things can be known with certainty by the natural light of human reason through the things he created. Therefore, you don't need to have faith to get to God. You just need to use reason. Now, faith builds on reason, which is why you will often hear people say that you need to have a solid philosophical system before you can do theology. And that, if you have bad philosophy, then you will also have bad theology. This is precisely why seminarians for the Catholic Church are required to study philosophy before theology. And one of my favorite quotes that is related to faith and reason is at the beginning of St. John Paul II's Fides et Ratio, which is faith and reason, when he says, Faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and now understand that the existence of God can be proved by reason alone. Of course, this wasn't the most in-depth treatment of it, but I hope this video will dispel a lot of myths and caricatures of Aquinas' first way, as well as answer a lot of people's questions on the topic. I know on YouTube there are just a ton of just trash videos out there that are just like absurd and ridiculous caricatures of the argument, so I, I, that's why I spent so much time making this, because I really feel like it's going to 
make a difference in, you know, people can cite this video and be like, hey, look, you're, you're completely misquoting Aquinas there. So hopefully guys you spread the news and spread this uh, video because it, it helps show people what really Aquinas believed and shows that the new atheists really do caricature everything. Anyway, if you like this video, hit the like button. Please consider subscribing because it helps me distribute these videos so that more people can watch them. And God bless. Or should I say, pure act to bless. Yeah, either way, have a good one.